Welcome back to the podcast. I am, as you can see, in a very different location than I usually am. And uh, I am actually up in South Dakota helping my sisters with some family things that have been happening and it's all good. Uh, but I am coming from a very different location. And so I will just say, welcome back to the podcast. If you are joining me and listening when this podcast comes out, I am right in the middle of teaching my 100K secrets to hosting private spiritual retreats and intensives. And there is still time to join us. Of course, we will put the link to the Facebook group in the show notes so that you can have access to that. We would love to have you. This uh, training is, well, it's not necessarily the nuts and bolts. We do talk about the nuts and bolts a little bit of hosting retreats and so on, but it really more is an inner game because what I find is that most of the time people can figure out pretty quickly how to, you know, set up a retreat and how to create an itinerary and how to do all of the um, kind of the functional things of the retreat. But what is being uncovered during this training is very interesting because it's usually not about not knowing what you want to provide for the retreat or who you want to work with, but there are a lot of um, inner, I'll say barriers that prevent spiritual entrepreneurs and light leaders from actually offering retreats. And so that is the kind of information that we will be tapping into and, and touching on in the second and third trainings of, of the uh, training. So if you would like to join us, the link is in the show notes. We have a private Facebook set, group set up. I'm going in there and commenting on people's ideas for retreats and so on. It's been a lot of fun. So please join us. Uh, your only uh, requirement really is to just provide your email so that my team can keep you apprised of uh, updates and any opportunities to work with me as well. So with that, I will get on with the show. And this week, as I was tuning in to what we were going to be talking about, what I have come to realize is kind of what I alluded to in the intro which is that for spiritual entrepreneurs, for leaders, for those people who identify as being intuitive and having intuitive channels, um, I think that it's very important for us to bring up this consideration for creating new offers and bringing them into the world and then um, entering into the uh, sacred economy, into the flow and uh, receiving compensation for our gifts. You know, for so many generations, the wise women and the healers of the community were paid in an exchange, in a barter system, really. Um, I will bring my chicken if you will please heal me. Or uh, thank you for helping me get pregnant and let me give you some more herbs for your, um, for your herb kitchen. And um, so this is something that has been transmitted throughout the generations for women in particular who go into the healing arts. And now we've reached a time in the world where it's really become important for us to step into the true uh, leadership of business because um, we don't get paid in chickens anymore and the economy does not, does not grow and thrive on, on bartering. It is a uh, financial or monetary exchange. And this is an important consideration when we are stepping into offering high-end anything, especially retreats and especially retreats that are spiritual or sacred in nature. I was having a conversation with a client earlier today, and I was just reminded of my experiences early on hosting retreats and intensives. And what I didn't bank on, what I didn't realize as I, as I studied the concept of hosting retreats and I, as I even attended retreats myself and got a feel for what it was like to be a client, to be on that side of the retreat. What I didn't bank on on hosting the retreats is how much of myself I would be bringing into the space. And I said to my client earlier today, I said, you know, retreats are a really intimate container. There are probably things that are more intimate than that, but there is um, there are very few, I think, because it's a sacred container and because if you are a spiritual entrepreneur, if you are an intuitive, you're bringing your gifts, your spiritual gifts into the container to share with your client. So there is a level of trust that is absolutely essential in order to be able to make sure that you feel safe enough to share your gifts and that your client feels safe enough to receive them. And so we can, it can feel a little bit like we're being too picky 
when we start picking apart who we're meant to work with and who we want to bring into our spaces and everything. But I will say, and this is not to make an excuse for anybody, myself included, but it, I think that we proceed with caution for, for a reason. And it perhaps isn't our personal experience that brings us into a place of caution, but it is the experience of the people who have come before us um, who have had some kind of poor, uh, it's not even a poor outcome, just a poor experience um, in an intimate container, meaning that things didn't go as planned or um, somebody brought in kind of combative or um, castrating energy or something like that into the retreat and that was unexpected and unplanned for. And then you had to deal with that in the moment and it kind of took away from the, the essence of the retreat itself. Not only that, when we begin really standing in our worth, our worthiness and our spiritual gifts, then there is a, an expectation that you would be um, pricing your programs at a place that is commensurate with your abilities. And uh, it's that financial exchange that brings up another layer of sometimes I'll call it difficulty in actually moving forward on offering retreats, because now it's not just I'm having fun with friends, pulling a few tarot cards or, you know, doing a reading on the side or anything like that. Now I'm actually hanging my shingle and saying, yes, I am available for retreats and this is how much it costs. And um, here's how you pay me. And that is a very basic um, element of doing business. And yet when we, when we look at the spiritual nature of the retreat and we look at the influences from outside of ourselves, both uh, in a family system way, uh, in the culture and society about who, um, who can charge for things, healers and spiritual leaders are not necessarily the first ones we think of that we would say, well, uh, of course, we would pay this person a lot of money in order to do their work and in order to help me in some way or in order to help me optimize my life in some way. So the conundrum is that you already know a lot of times what you would offer. You perhaps have had uh, attended a retreat yourself and have some ideas on how you would conduct your retreat based on what you learn from your own retreat leader or um, based on what they did or did not do, but you've come to some kind of conclusion about how you would do it. So it's not necessarily that that stops people, that stops uh, the spiritual entrepreneurs from offering retreats. Instead, it is a uh, deeper seated, I'll call it a reason, explanation, I think is probably a better word to use, explanation for the reluctance. And you most certainly can be a reluctant spiritual entrepreneur. You can be a reluctant leader. And that reluctance is born of your largely personal experiences, some of which have followed your, you and your entire life. Some of the things that influence your willingness to put yourself out into the public eye, to market your services, to call people into your business to begin really truly standing in your leadership as somebody who has capabilities to help other people uh, transform, actualize, ascend, pick the word, optimize. As somebody like that, um, you've probably had some things in your background, in your past that um, create some stickiness and prevent you moving forward. And what I said to my client today, because she brought this in, and I thought it was such a good conversation to to share with you, because um, I think it happens a lot more than than we think, first of all. And when it only is happening to you, we have this sort of um, nearsighted perspective on our experiences. And I um, am meaning that maybe it's only happening to me and nobody else has this experience. So I want to share this with you just because um, it's very it just is essential to shed light on this so that you can do something about it that is different than what you would have ordinarily thought. So you can be, let's say that you are designing your own spiritual retreat, for example, and you have all the pieces in place. And you know, for example, like I do, I have people come into Scottsdale and 
at some point during the retreat, we go and walk the labyrinth at the Francescan Renewal Center. This is one of my favorite interventions that I do with people. And because it's different every time, and even if they've walked it before, walking it again has a different experience and a different meaning for them. But that is one thing that I always do. But let's say you have all of these um, interventions, I'll say, or experiences, if you would like to be less clinical, uh, that will be helpful in their evolution. And um, so you get to that place and you say, oh my goodness, like I've done all of these things. I know that they are effective. I know that I have changed as a result myself of, of conducting these for myself. And so now I'm going to offer it to some somebody else. And then all of a sudden, the intellect gets involved. The worry comes in. The question marks, well, what if? Well, what if they don't like it? Well, what if they don't get benefit? Well, what if I made this all up in my head? Well, who am I to? Who am I to offer this? Perhaps I don't have the credentials that I believe are important, or perhaps I don't have the, the degree or the experience. And there are some that are worth looking at very rationally. If you don't have the experience, and if you are not competent in an area that you are wanting to offer, that would be a red flag. And you would say, okay, well, I can't offer that because I'm not an expert in it. But I find more often than not, interestingly, that the people who come into me and are talking with me about designing their own retreats are saying, well, how, how am I, how am I, it's not competent that they're worried about, it's more credentialed. Well, I don't have my PhD or I don't have a, an advanced degree or, 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 or. And I said to my client today, I said, listen, even if you have a PhD, even if you have a, an advanced degree in something, you will still have these questions. The questions don't leave just because you check a box. When I was first starting out, my question was, well, I have a PhD. Am I able to do this? Isn't that funny? It was the opposite for me. I had my degree and you would have thought, well, I can check that box. So now that gives me the freedom to offer retreats. But I still had the question rising up inside of me. Is it okay for me to do this? And I was waiting for somebody to tell me that it was okay for me to do it. Even though internally I had checked all the boxes, I was competent in the things that I was offering. I knew what I was doing. I was able to hold space. I was able to create transformation, but there was still the question there. So if somebody like me, who has a PhD and has won awards for her work and has been acknowledged by the field, as somebody who is more than capable and very, very bright, what about you? Perhaps you're like me and you are very, very bright and very accomplished and you still have that feeling of, well, I don't know if it's okay for me to do this. So I have a, I have a, what do I want to call it? A secret for you. And the secret is this, no one's coming. No one's coming to check off the box and say, okay, you're good to go. Because as a leader, you get to decide. And as a leader, you get to stand in it. And there will be some retreats that don't go well. Hopefully not very many. And probably it's not that the whole thing will not go well, but a part of it will be sort of bringing you into a place of uh, mindfulness and perhaps requiring some assistance or support from a trusted mentor or colleague. But ultimately you get to lead. But nobody is going to raise their hand for you and nobody's going to um, say, go for it. And even if they did, you wouldn't believe them. Even if I looked at all of your credentials and all of your trainings and everything that you have invested in over your lifetime. And I said, okay, you are good to go. There would still possibly be a reason that you would say no. Because 
It is not an external permission that you are seeking. Your reluctance is something internal that is coming to the surface, inviting you to examine and to shift. One of the most common experiences that I see when people are coming to me and talking to me about their retreats and their intensives and the things that they want to do in their business, but they are reluctant to begin or reluctant to move forward um, is the who am I syndrome, the imposter syndrome. And the imposter syndrome is something that has been in my mind baked into our culture. No woman is ever meant to actually feel like she belongs anywhere. Except where women belong in the pink collar jobs, perhaps. The pink collar jobs, meaning, you know, the traditional um, jobs that women took for generations, nursing and teaching and that kind of thing. So interestingly, that transcends into the healing and helping professions or the light workers and the light leaders hang out because for some reason, even though they're not, I would say mainstream jobs, and I use air quotes around jobs, but even though they're not mainstream jobs, they are still um, essential to the evolution of the people on this planet. And they still bring about great transformation for people. And they are still in some regard, I'll call it caregiving. And I don't mean that in any kind of, um, you know, victim rescue or persecutor way, but just in terms of um, their intimate relationships that we create with our clients. And so in some ways it stands to reason that imposter syndrome would be baked in because who am I to do that? This is a sacred position. Oh, and then we also have to look at the, uh, the priesthood, of course, in mainstream religion, which only allows men to be um, priests and uh, pastors. And so then we have to look at that as well as a, uh, something that's baked into the culture, whether or not you're religious, you're going to be somehow picking up on the message that, well, women cannot do this. And this, of course, is not true, as you know, but it's baked in. So it's like breathing air. It's breathing. It's in the air that you breathe. And so coming to understand that some of the imposter syndrome is um, just expected living in the culture that we live in. And there is nothing wrong with you. But that's the thing, right? That we take um, we take over responsibility for our experiences by saying, "Well, I just got into my head, or I was just thinking wrongly about this, or if only I could be different." Without really looking at what's in the what's in the ethers. And I'm sharing this with you, not to move into blame or anything like that, but just to say, we want to just be objective about it. And say, if we brushed away this etheric nonsense, and you were able to just do your work, just do the thing that you're called to do, how would life be different? And who's, whose advantage is it for you to not deliver your programs or your retreats? Whose advantage is it for you to maintain the status quo? And now we will pivot just a little bit because I want to come back to something, a statement that I made earlier, which is that it stands to reason that there are going to be some experiences that you would have had as a young child or even in, in utero 
that would affect how you feel about your work today. And these are things that often go un unnoticed, unacknowledged, unaware of, and yet have a very particular driving force in your decision to move forward with something that feels um, a bit edgy. I have said recently that the nervous system is wired for familiarity. In other words, you can be in a relatively unsafe experience, but the nervous system feels comfortable because it is familiar. And so if your nervous system from the beginning has been wired that uh, to, to uh, feel comfortable in situations where um, that are actually unsafe for you, that do not recognize your spiritual gifts, where it is unsafe for you to be fully yourself, then we have to take a look at the nervous system and say, okay, well, how can we optimize the nervous system so that it, it's reading the information correctly? And something like hosting a retreat or an intensive is going to bump up against your nervous system sensibilities. And it's going to say, no, this feels scary because it is new, it is novel. And so you can react to that and contract and say, mm, I think I'll put, press pause on this. I think I'll wait until this summer. But when we calibrate the nervous system and restore it and optimize it so that the nervous system is reading the information correctly, reading its surroundings correctly, being able to accurately discern what is safe and what is unsafe, Then you've got a chance of moving forward into an unknown and very exciting way of delivering your service services. And that's when actually the money flows as well. When the contraction is over and you relax into the experience of stepping into your role as a, as a leader of a retreat. Another way that your childhood experiences might influence whether or not you actually begin hosting retreats consistently is uh, your interactions with other kids. You know, in our circles, we call it often the sister wound, but I would say, especially because I work with so many highly, highly able people with very, very smart brains in their heads, um, it goes beyond just a gender issue. It really, um, feeling very different from everybody else from the time you're a little kid creates the conditions for you to um, feel rejected by your peers. And so why in the world would you invite uh, people who seem to be your peers into an intimate container with you? If you've had these experiences from childhood where uh, you were in a, in a group of children who didn't understand you. So there are a lot of sneaky ways that um, our experiences as young children, as teenagers, as young adults will wend their way into our plans for our future. And so when I talk with people about hosting their retreats and they have these ideas in their minds and they have the vision, we trust the vision first of all, Usually it's the location that speaks first. When you say, oh, I want to do a retreat here. That certainly was the case for me um, when I was, I've been coming to Sedona for years and years and always knew that I would host retreats. And just return from one, hosting a three day retreat with a private client, one client for three days. She did great, by the way. I was not too much for her. I was not too much for her. And that is largely because I trusted myself and I trusted her 
and I trusted the process, but it has taken me a long time to get here. And I will say early in my work as an entrepreneur, as a coach, when I was hosting um, retreats back in, well, this would have been 10 years ago, I had people coming in to Scottsdale for a day and I would rent a high-end uh, uh, suite at one of our beautiful resorts and I would host overnight. I would go home and allow them to stay in the, in the suite and it was lovely. Um, but I did so many of them that I got burned out and I didn't plan on that. And I still had to deliver and I had to deliver my best and I was delivering my best as best I could. But at some point I said, I can't do this anymore. So I had to learn how to, how to negotiate the energetics of the retreat. How many is too many for me? And that will be something that you can learn as well, managing the energy, managing your energy, coming into a place of being in flow where the energy is endless so that you feel at the end revitalized and excited about what is next, but also allowing yourself time to rest and rejuvenate. So there is a lot that goes into planning and hosting spiritual retreats, a lot. Some of it is details, but I would say probably, I'll give it like 30% are details, a lot of which an assistant can handle. Booking your venue, deciding on what snacks you're going to provide, that kind of thing. I would say 70% is an inside job. It's who you're becoming as you open yourself up as a leader who is hosting retreats, as you move through your own insecurities about who am I and my credentials and my degrees. But that is what is called for right now. That is what is called for. to lift other people up, not, I say that not in uh, rescuing. I don't mean it in rescuing. I just mean um, to provide a place for people to come up and hang out with you in your beautiful light. To remind them of who they are so that they can carry their light forward. That is the purpose of all of it. Activations, illuminations. And the good news about retreats being activations and illuminations is that <clears throat> how you conduct the retreat, how you conduct the retreat will be different from how I conduct a retreat because my energy signature is very different from yours. But if you are holding the space and you are in your leadership as a conductor and you're allowing the, um, the energetics or I call it the magic of the retreat to unfold, then the illuminations and the activations are just a natural consequence of being there and holding the energy, holding the container and being in your leadership. See, I think one of the uh, misunderstandings about being a retreat leader is that it's very um, arduous and I am exhausted and I have to do everything all by myself. And certainly I have had those experiences where I have not allowed myself the support that I really required in order to be at my very best. And those days have come and gone, because now I know that there are certain requirements that I have in order to be able to conduct retreats in the energy that I deserve, that my client deserves for the best possible outcome. 
And by the way, this is one of the reasons that when we think about retreats, a lot of times people think of groups, a group of people going somewhere. That to me is a whole nother level. I have done both private one-on-one -on -one, and I have hosted retreats with up to, I think probably 17 people is the most I've hosted. So they're very different energetics. For many, many reasons. And so when we, when I talk about these private retreats, I really do make reference to one-on-one, -on -one, me and you and your business. That's all that's really required, the three of us. And when I work with people who are wanting to host retreats and they come in for an intensive or a retreat to figure out their retreats, to basically manifest their retreats, um, we look at things like you and a client who's burned out, you and a client who wants to figure out what's next with her life. Not everything has to be about business. But the essential part of every retreat is that you are fully in your leadership. So there's no part of you who is trying to rescue or save. There is no part of you who is um, particularly concerned about what they think of you. or if they think that you are a fraud, or if they think that you don't know what you're doing. Because really when you are in your leadership energy, when you are in, when you are channeling who you actually are at a very, very deep and honest level, there's no problem there. And you're just being you and you are in flow. And that is the best place for us to be, whether we're conducting retreats for one or a hundred people. But for the purposes of this podcast today, what I really want to convey to you is um, if you are feeling called to host a retreat, you start with one person and do a few. I love doing the one-on-ones my favorite and that's not to say I won't also offer group opportunities as well but I really love doing the one-on-one -on -one. there's a preciousness to it and quite frankly because I work with women in uh, medicine in healthcare, care uh, in engineering along with, of course, the spiritual entrepreneurs who I work with on this kind of thing, the, the women who are coming in from healthcare and tech in particular uh, don't want to be in a big group of people. They don't want to talk about their deepest fears or their, their biggest problems in front of a bunch of people. And they certainly don't want to cry in front of a bunch of people. It's not that they won't or can't come to big retreats. It just is that there is a level of, I'll use it again, intimacy as the word to describe it, that um, is a natural outgrowth of hosting these private retreats. But the thing about it is, and I want you to really pay attention to this, is because of the level of intimacy that is involved in hosting one-on-one -on -one retreats, you better be crystal clear about who you are, what your purpose is, and to make sure that all of your requirements are met so you do not try to lay your requirements on your client. There can be a level of transference and counter-transference that takes place in a retreat that can be, well, it can become, I'll say problematic. And what I mean is that if you're not aware of it and you don't know how to deal with it, it can create some problems, some conflict, um, castration. So 
So big headline message, please make sure that you are crystal clear, healthy. Know who you are, know what your purpose is. That you trust your retreat to be the, um, to contribute its own energy. That you trust the location to contribute its own energy. And then you trust yourself. to bring your best energy into the retreat. When those three things are crystal clear, people step in, money flows. And there's a beautiful point of entry for uh, the people who are meant to work with you in the longer term as well. Because after the retreat, what is next? After the retreat, perhaps they wanna go on their own and figure things out and make sense of things on their own. But after the retreat, perhaps they would like to work with you to implement, to continue to be their guide or their mentor, to continue the deep discussions that had started on the retreat. One of the big things that changed for me in all the work that I've done over these years in terms of understanding my own energy, when I was trying to do things all by myself, when I was trying to predict and control everything that was happening during a retreat and make sure I was to the T on every detail, when I was trying to solve all the problems for my client, when I was trying to do all the work and make all the effort in order to bring about a transformation for my client, that is when I really burned out. I was exhausted. And then I learned how to trust my channel I learned how to trust the process. So I was just responding to the energy that was in front of me. Of course, I still had a plan, a map for where we were headed, but the navigation, how we were to get there, I left up to the container itself, the retreat. I left up to my channel and I left up to my client. When I stopped feeling solely and wholly responsible for my clients' results, that's when things opened up. And it could be for you that if you are feeling like you are called to host retreats and you have the yeah buts, yeah, but what about this? Yeah, but what about that? It could be that uh, there is part of you who really deeply believes that you are solely and wholly responsible for a client's outcomes. And that we can trace back all the way to gestation. A deep seated sense of over responsibility. While at the same time, wisely knowing that you cannot be responsible for another person's outcomes. I know you can see and feel the conflict there. And that is actually what is uh, creating the conditions for you to hesitate. And that is also the linchpin. In other words, when that is neutralized And when you come back to a place where you recognize that you can be a contribution, but you are not the cause, you can offer a perspective then that is when everything flows in the retreat, not just in your retreat in your in your business.
So with that, I'm going to go ahead and close for today. I hope that you found this helpful. If you did, I would love it if you would do a couple of things. Uh, you could take a screenshot of the episode and tag me in it in social media so I can say thank you. You could leave a review on the podcast uh, uh, platform. That would be lovely. You could share it with somebody who you think could benefit from being part of our community and hearing this message. And if you are feeling called to get one-on-one -on -one support with your own retreat development and implementation and sales, uh, you can reach out to me by just a, let's book a call, drrobinmckay.com forward slash call. And uh, let me know that you want to talk about working together to develop and sell your retreats to the tune of $100,000 in a month, if you would like. So that is my invitation to you. It's been a joy to be here with you and I will see you next time.